Thank you. It's actually tokini. I always tell people it rhymes with martini, and that helps a little bit. <laughs> I got into this business as a creative person. And in the late 90s, transitioned to um, taking my agency from being traditional to digital. And we were lucky to ride on the coattails of Dell. We worked with Dell Computer for about 25 years, and so they dragged us along. You know, you had to prove every quarter that you were generating an ROI or you were gone. And then um, I was lucky enough to sell our agency to Archer Malmo last July, so I'm, I'm interested in, you know, discovering what's next for, for me as, as I no longer have to be an agency owner, but get to kind of return to my roots. And I remember the first time a client asked me, what's the ROI on creativity? I was selling a logo to a CEO, and it had this great little illustration, and the illustration was $12,000. It's beautiful. And he goes, Yvonne, so, so what would be the ROI on that? I had no idea what to say to him. I looked down and I said, well, Dan, what's the ROI on that gold Rolex? And what's the ROI on your Porsche? And this copy, this table we're sitting at cost at least $25,000. It's um, ever since we became a digital uh, industry, this desire to predict what the ROI is on everything has really kind of taken over. And you guys probably remember this experiment, the marshmallow experiment that occurred at Stanford in the 70s where children were given a marshmallow and they were told, if you don't eat the marshmallow, in 15 minutes we'll give you two marshmallows. So the child had to figure out whether they should eat that marshmallow or whether they should wait 15 minutes and get more. And that required imagining a better future for themselves. That required sitting there and thinking, hmm, maybe, maybe there's a better future than what I've got right now. That is not what we as marketers are doing today. I call this whole thing about predictability, marketing on crack. We're addicted to being able to predict what's going to happen every step of the way. Our CEOs want to know. They don't want to guess. They don't want to have to imagine a better future for themselves. They want to know right now that parachute is going to open. So we're in the business of delivering predictability. And just about every idea I put in front of anybody, the question comes up, well, what would be the ROI on that? We want to know. So we're using all of our tools, and we're using all of our data, and we're using now predictive analytics to deliver predictability. We're selling predictability. This is a great example of one of those tools. All right, Mars mission, give me a go, no go for launch. Booster. Go flight. Retro. Go flight. Mission control, we are ready. Ten, nine, eight, seven, It's the sponsor. Data shows we need to make the logo bigger. Thanks, Mission Control. We are ready. Again. Nine, eight, seven, six. Sir, it's the sponsors again. Data shows millennials don't like the color. And we need a hashtag. Ten, nine, eight, seven. What? Search data shows Mars is no longer trending? They want to send them to Pluto. Pluto? Pluto? Hey, Jose, this is a vaccine. Eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one. What happened? Well, sorry, guys. They burnt up their budget. We have to push the launch to Q4. What? <laughs> So we have a lot of tools these days that help us deliver predictability, and you've all seen this chart. This is only 25% of the tools that we're expected to vet, to purchase, 
to learn how to use, to integrate it into our world. And CEOs have immense confidence in these. They say that the digital marketing is the most important technology-powered investment their firms can make. They believe in technology. They want predictability. And at the same time, Serious Decisions says it is we are struggling to learn how to deploy all of these systems, particularly marketing automation. 75% of us are learning through trial and error. I will write a book someday called Everything I Know I Learned by Screwing Up, because it's true. It's a very expensive way to learn. And it's a dirty little secret that most of us really don't know that much about what we're doing when it comes to deploying all these tools that promise predictability to our clients. And the fact that we're having to learn all this and do all this is changing the fabric of the agency culture these days. Where do creative people fit in this world? Well, creative, the world of creative people is changing too. And the nature of our creative teams is changing as well. And there's a lot of bad creativity out there. This is a popular new typeface called Curls. To combat things like this, somebody just launched a, <laughs> a website called Font Flame. This is Tinder for fonts. All you have to do is like it or not like it, right? And then you can look at the font selections that really good designers have designed and just pick that. This is how people who can't design design. And this is how people who can't create create. There's, we have tools for this now, too. So this discussion started in the 90s. A lot of intellectuals started talking about, well, what really is design anymore? What constitutes design? We're no longer just a bunch of people doing headlines and copy and with our exacto knives cutting ruby lith and you know the whole craft of what we used to do has completely gone away. So who are the designers and what is design? And this, this man, Herbert Simon, has been quoted a lot in the intellectual papers about design because he said, everyone, who desi everyone designs who devises courses of action aimed at changing existing situations into preferred ones. Existing situations into preferred ones. So if that's true, if anybody is a designer who changes an existing situation into a preferred situation, wow, all I have to do is figure out you like chocolate pie better than lemon pie, and I'm designing a better future for you. But today, we're expected to just, we're even expected to predict what pie you're going to like. And that's not all. I'm supposed to predict what pie you like, and I'm supposed to also understand when you're going to feel hungry, where you're going to be when you feel hungry, and then I'm supposed to understand your deep need for chocolate pie, and what that reminds you of, and hearken back to that memory of you know, that first time you had chocolate on your mother's lap when you were three years old, and, and, and serve that up to you as the motivation for chocolate pie. And, and that's what we're doing these days. That's what marketers are expected to do. So we're creating a preferred situation in a way when we develop our banner ad campaigns. We can get a response rate of 2%. And next week, we can get a response rate of 3%. And the next week, we can get a response rate of 6%. And we're in the business of saying, delivering response models that predict our ad's going to respond. We're going to get better and better responses every single week. And this is good. And we pat ourselves on the back and we say, nice job, Yvonne. Boy, look at that improvement in response rate. And clients love it. It's predictable. But the problem with then we have the creative people who are, wah, 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 we don't like doing banner ads. This isn't very creative. Who's ever heard that? Um, and then it's like, well, what are we going to do with the creative team that doesn't like doing the banner ads and doesn't want this incremental improvement? And at the same time, the program managers are wondering, well, do we even need a creative person to create those incremental improvements that made the shift between 2% and 6%? Did anybody even see the difference? Right? 
And so what's the ROI on creativity if A, they don't want to work on it, and B, we don't really need to spend that money on creative people in order to make those incremental shifts that make the results improve to the point where the client is ecstatic. This focus on incremental improvement, these tiny little inching forward to a more preferable state that we're focused on today as an industry has really taken the wind out of the sails of a lot of our creative talent. And they're moving into other areas, they're finding other things to do, and they're realizing that our industry has changed to the point where um, there's not even a place for a lot of our creative talent. There was this um, conference at, in New York with Ad Week on September 30th. A lot of big guys got together. Martin Sorrell said that the traditional attitude in our industry, that creative is king, has to change. Condé Nast said story is king. AT&T said results are king. And Fox Network said we don't live in a monarchy anymore. But everybody at the conference agreed on this. The idea of creativity has to be broadened to include data, strategy, interactivity, and other concepts. That does not mean that data is the new creative field. There's still a role for creativity, but it has to be broadened. Creatives and designers are entering all these new fields now. There's UX design, service design, strategic design, transformation design. Anybody is a designer who, who creates a more preferable state, right? Design is becoming this cross-disciplinary field that includes almost anything. Uh, the guy in Seinfeld would have loved this. So if creativity is problem solving and innovation, we're also in the business now of predicting our audience, predicting how we're going to uh, reach them, predicting what sort of state they're in and how we're going to get to know them. Knowing when and where they're going to want something is just table stakes. We now have to understand why they want it. Why do you want that chocolate pie? Understanding consumers' basic drives. A great example of this is Nike. We all, when we think about great brands, a lot of us think back on those wonderful ads that Nike used to do. You know, the just do it and that beautiful photograph. Wow, we all wanted to do that. But today, if you look at what Nike's doing, they're not doing those kinds of ads anymore to generate their brand. What they're doing is a combination of apps, social situations, they've got sensors and running shoes, um, wearable devices, training programs online, social networks. Um, they've built this whole ecosystem around their products that engages customers in a completely new way. This is the new Nike branding. Nobody really talks about this, but this is understanding, this is getting down to what drives people to run, what drives them to compete, what drives us to want to win, what drives us to want to have beautiful bodies. And they're tapping into that in a way that uses all of these different types of creativity. So this incrementally making things better is just fine, except that it doesn't take those giant leaps towards understanding what's next out there. What's the next wonderful thing I should desire? I can desire to see slightly better I can get better and better glasses and want to improve my vision, but this is a whole new experience. You can't go to a focus group of people who are buying glasses and say, what is, what is the next big thing in, in, in vision, and have them suggest an Oculus Rift. So this is where our designers have to push themselves. This is the real X factor in creativity that's going to exceed our marketers' predictions and analysts' expectations, and this is where creative people are going to be able to win for us in, biz in our businesses and in other businesses. And I think we're going to be lucky if we can keep the, pe the people who can create these types of ideas are not staying in ad agencies. So this form of creativity is the type that causes us to define what we prefer for ourselves instead of just incrementally move along, inch along, and, and make things better. 
we have to help people discover what they desire, not just make what we already have more preferable. <clears throat> and this is really, this way of integrating new technologies and tools and methods to solve our problems is how we've always flourished as a society. I watched Honeywell over the years try and try and try and incrementally improve their thermostats. I bought three thermostats for my house, hoping that each time I'd be able to learn how to program it for myself. And I was never able to do it. And the guy just thought I was too stupid, but I was just, you know, I'm just the, what I call the ADC, the average dumb consumer. And then Nest came along, and I'll never go back. Completely changed the way we deal with heating and cooling. And all those nights I beat a with a broomstick the, the, the horrible smoke sensor in the top of the ceilings that they go off in the middle of the night, and now Nest has conquered that too. So, so this is such a great quote. Do not go where the path may lead. Go instead to where there is no path and leave a trail. We have Ralph Waldo to thank for that. We all remember you know, our incremental improvements in the way that we control devices. But now we're about to be um, exposed to this wonderful new technology that Google offers. Hmm, for some reason, our video's not playing, but um, that uses um, uses sensors, radar sensors, to to detect the tiniest little movements that your fingers make, and and so this is one of the again one of those magnificent leaps towards something. This is not incrementally better. This is far superior to the way that we've ever thought about controlling our devices. So we need this innovation and creativity for the products. We need it for the way we experience the products and the marketing products all at once. We can't think about these things separately anymore. We're not just in the business of headlines and visuals. We have to move into thinking about all of these things at the same time. And a great example of this is this mattress company that just launched uh, recently. They're moving from Boston to New York to Philadelphia. And the way they're marketing is to take a trailer through all the cities and let people crawl into these little um, cubby holes and experience the mattress. They can get in there and take pictures. They can feel the sheets. And they can listen to some bedtime stories. <laughs> and this is creating an experience for buyers that is completely new. And it's inexpensive. And it's high impact. And it has nothing to do with media. Another example is this new shoe from Vibram, and it wraps around your foot, and it fits into this awesome little package. But, but this is the kind of creativity that our, our best minds are using to compete with, with Nike and other brands. And I've got three more examples for you of really good instances where, where this is, is taking place. The first one is in the crowded world of of make There's so much choice, confusion, and anxiety involved in buying cosmetics. People often stay with what they know. In this environment, how do you get people to trial your product? You give them an entirely new way to try on makeup. Oh my god! Oh, it's exciting, isn't it? This is Makeup Genius from L'Oreal Paris, the first mobile app to let you try on makeup using nothing but your phone. Makeup Genius scans your face and then allows you to select from a huge range of L'Oreal cosmetics. And the result is so realistic, it's like you're actually wearing it. There I am! It's red lipstick! Oh, I could look like pure reds. Oh, wow! To users, it seems like magic. But the augmented reality behind Makeup Genius was 18 months in the making incorporating thousands of products and over a hundred unique facial expressions. You can try on just an eyeliner or create complete looks. Once you like what you see, you can save your look and share it with friends. 
and you can purchase directly from the app. Makeup Genius takes the hassle out of the in-store experience, allowing you to scan products and try them on virtually. The launch of Makeup Genius caused something of a stir. resulting in over 10 million people downloading it. And so far, they've tried on over 25 million different looks using over 65 million products. That's 65 million more product trials worldwide. Makeup Genius from L'Oreal Paris. I can't stop looking at myself. <laughs> I love the impact of that and I love the integration of, you know, the product and the technology and understanding what motivates young women with makeup. This is another great example. Creating a differentiation for a product is sometimes almost impossible when there's parity in the marketplace. And that's an um, amazing example of uh, creativity being used to create that. And then finally, here's one more. The bar is pretty high. I mean, this is, I think, where the bar is for our industry today. It's not back down in the weeds of headlines and, and visuals where I started my career. 
But the question is, why aren't we all doing this? If this is what we need to do to be successful, why aren't we doing this? And the answer is because it's really, really hard. It's uh, something that we can't generate predictably. You can't just tell a team to come up with this stuff. You can't teach it in a way that can be documented and replicated predictably, right? So we, if we can't promise it and we can't predictably deliver it, it's difficult. It also can't be turned into an industry the way marketing automation has. So it's very ephemeral. Um, and a lot of agencies are tuned. They're a machine that is tuned to deliver a completely different product. So it's easy to just say, well, it's all subjective anyway, right? And as long as, as, long as the client is happy, as long as we're doing good enough, as long as you know, the money's rolling in and the jobs are going along, uh, if our litmus test is, is the client happy? Well, if the client's happy enough, then we just kind of keep going. And, um, and I'm afraid that, that that's the path that a lot of agencies are on that's going to, to lead to, back to that dinosaur slide we saw a few minutes ago. I have a good friend who used to be the executive creative director at GSDNM in Austin for many years, and now he's in California. And I wanted to ask him, how does, he, how, do, how does he explain what makes creative work exceptional? Because as a head of an agency or as a leader in an agency, we have to often judge. And that's a question that I struggle with, is how do you know? How do you know when you see an idea? Is it good? Is it good enough? When do you tell somebody to go back and try again? And who gets to judge? And that's something that's always fascinated me. Guy says part of the reason great creative works is that it's a mystery. And the reason it's a mystery is that it hasn't been done before. New is inherent to creativity. The first time you do something, it's art. The second time, it's science. Art is unknown until you discover it or stumble on it. Creative ideas start out with the known and the familiar, and then they surprise. Without the surprise, you don't have an idea. You just have what someone else has already done. So if you're looking at the work, if you're, if you're the person who's assessing it and you think, well, is this good enough? Is it, is it a seven on a scale to, of one to 10? Is it a three? I always have my scale of one to 10, and I'm always trying to imagine, like, for me, and, and when I started out, I thought, would this be in CA magazine? That was my litmus test for that's when it's really good enough. And oftentimes, I would look at my work and say, nope, that's not, that sure wouldn't be in CA. And then it would help me understand, well, why wouldn't it be? And, and I could hone in on what was wrong with it. But in assessing other people's work these days, it's, it's so broad, it's hard to know. And I asked Guy that question, and he said, how do I justify telling someone that their seven isn't good enough? Because if they're truly about doing great creative, there's no such thing as good enough, and they know it. Good enough sucks. Good enough is the enemy of great. Good enough should be shot on sight and buried without haste. I don't argue that I know it's only good enough. I only insist on it being great. How do I know the difference? How do you know the difference between truth and a lie? As in, that guy says all the right things, and there's just something about him I don't like. You look for the answer in your gut, or more to the point, your gut tells you without ever hearing the question. The gut is about as scientific as it gets. And the problem is, that's not predictable. It kind of goes back to what Jerry Reed said, if you're hot, you're hot, and when you're not, you're not. And that's the enigma of our business today. We're all trying to figure out this amazing intersection between data and technology and marketing. Where do we fit in this sandbox? How do we play in here? But this is where we experience the decreased risk, the increased certainty. This is how we deliver predictability. And a lot of us are thinking, this is differentiation. No, it's not differentiation. We're using creatives like a vendor off in the agency. You know, 
yeah, they don't want to do the banner ads, and yeah, they don't like working on half the stuff we have for them to do, and so they're leaving and they're finding other places to go where they are a whole lot more appreciated. What we need to do is include creativity in everything we do. Data, technology, and marketing need to sit within the big, vast swimming pool of creativity, and everybody needs to become a person who designs, who's creating a more preferable state in everything that they do. The creative director in our company now, Matt Rand, told me that the best boss he ever had was a guy who told him that you only need to be right two-thirds of the time. Instead of having to saddle the task of being predictable, of delivering predictable results 100% of the time, which is what we ask of ourselves a lot, it's impossible to be creative if you're thinking you have to deliver predictability 100% of the time. But if you only have to be right two-thirds of the time, that means you get to learn a third of the time. Because that's how we learn, as we make mistakes. And if we can start to give ourselves, as people in this business, the permission, if we can build in the space to be wrong a third of the time, to continue to learn, to experiment, to trust our gut, a little bit more and depend on the predictability a little bit less, then that is how we will finally leave a trail. Thank you. <laughs>